Okay, here we are, home stretch. This is lecture 10, hip hop, then and now. The notes are really important, pull them up so we can talk about it. So, picture, South Bronx, New York City, late 1960s. Now we know that um, the 1960s as a decade are fraught with civil rights issues. We have, you know, the assassination of um, Martin Luther King um, in the first part of that decade. We have the assassination of JFK. We have the attempted assassination of um, Robert Kennedy. We have a, a, you know, various attempted assassinations of other folks. Um, it's fraught with civil rights um, distress and <clears throat> gang warfare. At the time, there were some very prominent gangs in New York City that were um, having, you know, various territorial and economical difficulties, and one of them was called the Black Spades. And at the end of, of the decade, in the 1960s, at the end of the 1960s, a guy named Africa Bambada became the leader of that gang. And he had this kind of like spiritual epiphany and he shifted the gang to what has become known as the Zulu Nation. And the Zulu Nation embarked on shifting the gang behavior into social welfare behavior. So they developed programs like um, breakfasts in schools and they would, you know, make uh, breakfast sandwiches and distribute them in public schools to kids who were hungry and a bunch of other very interesting and at the time innovative social programs for their community in the South Bronx. And Africa Bombada became a huge leader. He was leading this, you know, army of um, social workers um, through this what had been a gang um, situation. And because of his sort of um, charisma, he um, would, would throw these big parties and honor the community and raise consciousness for the community and um, have, you know, large speeches and um, disseminate information and, uh, and play music at these um, events. And the events would often turn into dance parties. And he was, um, not just him, but the group became, you know, the, as a community, you know, as a nation, really, we became fascinated with James Brown and, uh, you know, the, the rise of rock and roll and the shift of rock and roll into funk um, in the 1960s. And uh, <clears throat> that brought up a lot of really interesting movement um, that became integrated into events like what African Bambada was holding for the Zulu Nation. Also at the time, for these, you know, the social unrest, the there had been, um, there was a rise in graffiti art, and graffiti artists were tagging and, you know, creating these pictures in the city to express themselves about um, their distress socially about the decline of their neighborhoods and um, really to deface um, and you know call attention to problems in their communities and um, that was developing alongside um, these uh, you know these other like music events and the movement that was coming out and um, so it became this this cultural moment um, hip hop, the beginnings of hip hop. So, um, Bambada wasn't the only one that was sort of tapping into this moment of change, this kind of revolution. Um, a guy named Clive Campbell, who's known as Cool Herc, who was really great friends. If, I don't know if you guys are hip hop fans, but Grandmaster J. Um, anyway, there's lots of, you know, momentous people coming out of this area, era. Um, Clive Campbell, also known as DJ Cool Herc, was a Jamaican immigrant, and he became a DJ who was playing just the break sections, and of course, Grandmaster J, um, you know, and uh, anyway, 
developing these looping techniques and figuring out how to spin records without damaging them and playing breaks over and over again so uh, a tiny piece of the song would turn into a big break like they'd say well the best part of the song is this or whatever and they would mark it out and try to loop it over and over and over again. And remember, in the 1970s, there wasn't digital technology. So everything was being done on turntables. Um, and uh, so these guys, these DJs, were really innovative and creating a new way of making music. Of course, because this was all done on turntables, there weren't live musicians. So the music wasn't being recorded in any way. It was just spun and practiced live for these big events, these parties that were happening. But the little sections of music that they were turning into, you know, big moments uh, at the parties were called breaks and they would try to lengthen the break. And of course, the dancing that happened on the break then becomes break dancing, um, which is also really fascinating. So I want to take a break right here, and uh, I want you to watch a little bit of the James Brown influence. You don't have to watch the whole clip, but what do you see in this clip? Okay, it's actually not James Brown dancing. If you know James Brown, he is a fantastic, fabulous dancer. And, uh, musician from the 1960s and 70s, um, funk music and rock and roll music. And, but this actually features a, a, a woman dancer and just see what you think, you know, think 1970. Okay. So from that moment, from this sort of history, this cultural revolution that's happening and the changes in how we're listening to music on record, Hip-hop comes together in and breaks down into four elements. There's DJing, the spinning and mixing of music. There's MCing, which is someone who's speaking over the top, usually calling people out in the audience or saying, where is the next party? Or let's get this party moving. Um, you know, calling out dance movements. This would be the MC. And he is the um, predecessor to a rapper. Um, but he's the MC, what we call the master of ceremonies, someone who is leading and guiding the audience. And then there are the B-boys or the B-girls, and those are break dancers, and they do a lot of tricking and things on the break. Um, oftentimes in early hip-hop in the early 70s, um, they came in teams, and they would have you know team choreography, and they would battle in teams. And then, of course, as we move into the 80s, you see a lot of single battles and, you know, like the cardboard pun, the head spins and stuff. So um, that would be the, the b-boying. And then there's the graffiti artists. And also playing into hip-hop culture, um, as you probably know and recognize, are fashion of the time. And, you know, this is all, in the 70s and 80s, this is all really underground. But as we move through media, comes into play, right? The way we get attention, how we get attention comes into play for hip hop culture. Okay, I want you to pause and watch the next clip, which really gives you a sort of fuller picture of the community aspect and the, the sort of um, wholeness of the, the culture as I have just broken it down for you. Okay. So moving on to movement specifically, because this is, you know, we're going to look at, at the movement, at um, the dancing portion of it. So popping was a term that was used to describe the sub sudden muscle contractions. And popping and locking, um, while they can be separate movements, and we can consider them separate movements now, in the 1970s, they were really put together. It was popping and locking. And... Uh, I also wanted to sort of call out that uh, you probably noticed from the previous clip that hip hop wasn't terminology that was being used um, by the public at large. It wasn't mainstream a mainstream word to describe anything. So the music and the dancing, they were all just parties and it was rock music or funk music, spun music, um, dance music. But it wasn't actually hip-hop. It wasn't called hip-hop by mainstream culture until 
really into the 1980s. So these dancers considered themselves like rock dancers, um, and the, the break dancing they thought of as like choreography, as um, you know, they made up. It wasn't improv. It wasn't improvised early on. It was set, and so you're gonna watch this clip from. They originally called the Campbell Lockers after Clive Campbell, who was DJ Cool Herc. Um, but then they just came to be called the Lockers. And this clip is from 1971, and I think that's so important because this this movement. Um, we think of as being, you know, something done today, locking or whatever, but it's old, 1971, you know, that's getting up on, you know, 40, 50 years old. So it's not new movement. Um, so take a look at the lockers from 1971. Okay, so some outside influences to hip hop culture as it was developing include um, Chinese martial art films, specifically Bruce Lee, became really popular in the 1970s and was a big influence on movement, including freezes and battles and um, the way um, people thought of in terms of combat and the idea of, you know, competition um, and sparring, really. And though that influence really led to the development of break dancing going from something set like the rock dancers that you just saw the lockers um, into really improvised battles and of course that's also evolving in tangent with the MCs who are going from set like wordsmithed and you know written out lyrics to improvisational rhyming and rapping um, so the movement and the way the way the MCs are developing lyrics are sort of in tandem. They're parallel lines that are evolving together and influenced by, you know, these, these um, martial art films. And then, of course, I hope that you made the connection to Capoeira um, from our Module 2 exploration and the ways in which tricking and really athletic virtuosic movement comes into play in these battles. Um, you often see, and you'll find clips, I know um, you'll be looking for that, movement you'll find these you know breakdance battles where they're they take they're taking place in a circle just like capoeira where there's like this sense of you know uh, tricking over and under around each other um and also playing into that idea of community and what it means to be um you know what you're fighting for what you're dancing for and now hip-hop isn't really a training ground not like capoeira but it sure, certainly represents a moment of community-centered philosophy and engagement and enactment of community belief systems. And that brings me to thinking about contemporary hip-hop. And this next clip will give you, um, it's rather long, I think it's about a half an hour of watching, so maybe you take it in stages, that's your choice. You should watch the whole thing. It really is a nice breakdown of um, a contemporary perspective of hip hop. It sh it it shows hip hop from a like peaceful conflict resolution perspective, um, which I think is um, really fascinating and an important perspective to include in our discussion about hip hop. Um, so watch that when you're ready to watch that clip. I'm going to go ahead and finish the lecture here, and I support you coming back to that clip in a few minutes. So who is Rennie Harris? I'm going to throw out a name, Rennie Harris, and what does he do with hip-hop movement? You can read about him on his website page that I've included here, but just to give you a quick rundown, Rennie Harris is a hip-hop movement artist who takes street dance uh, he grew up in Philadelphia on the streets in the 1970s and 80s, and he's taken that movement, and in the 90s, he made a dance company with hip-hop. So he's not a trained dancer like we see with the modern, the postmodern, the contemporary work, but he has, you know, grown up training in hip-hop style on the streets. And that really, like, inspires me to ask the question, to ask you the question, 
what is hip hop? If it can go from the streets to the stage, what is it? And can it go from the street to the stage? Can hip hop be a concert form? Um, what, how does it influence culture and vice versa? Like, is this a folk dance? Um, is this, you know, how do we consume it? And that leads me back to um, the, 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 um, the longer contemporary hip hop video clip that I hope you'll go back to and thinking about how is hip hop hip hop capitalized on? Where does it become commercial and mainstream and where does it remain in that really revolutionary countercultural place where it began? Does it evolve? Should it evolve? Like should it become mainstream? A lot of questions. Think about it. Think about it. Form an opinion. And then when you watch the Rennie Harris um, company dancing, pure movement, dancing, describe it with your LMA terms, body, space, time. Like, what are the effort factors involved that you see and how would you break that down? Um, and would you break that down differently if you were watching that movement in the street? Does it change? Um, does it change your expectations and your biases? So... Enjoy this, this, these clips and this lecture. Hip hop is a lot of fun. Um, ask me questions if you have them, and I'll see you on the blackboard.